So thanks for continuing on in Church of the Rock's expedited audio training. You know, once again, my name is Isaac, I'm the audio tech here at Church of the Rock. And in session one, we learned all about the Crave values and audio fundamentals, but for session two, we will be learning about sound systems and troubleshooting. You know, if you ever have a rough day doing sound, it's probably going to have to do something with this stuff. Something's not working, people are waiting for you, and you have no idea how to fix it. So learning all the different components of a sound system and how they all work together and how they can be fixed in a logical and systematic way will go a huge way in helping you not fall into those situations. So please watch this video uh, in full and complete all of the questions and then we are going to put this all into practice as long as, uh, along with the previous session in our hands-on training session coming up. And I think that's going to be a really helpful thing for you. All right, let's get into it. Well, today in session two, we're going to talk about sound system setup, troubleshooting, and in addition to that, we're going to talk about how to lay out a stage. And so the very first part of that is sound system setup. It's really important to get this right, and this is sometimes part of a building project or part of uh, when you build a room to get these factors right. But man, there's many times where you also will set up a room from scratch. So the more you know about how your sound system works and all the individual components, the better luck you'll have with your system, you'll have less feedback, your band will feel more comfortable, it'll be easier to hear things well, and overall you'll have a better experience. And what I have in front of us here now is a very simplified version of a sound system. And I'm going to walk through some of those individual components. So the first thing you have is sources that go into a mixing board. So you'll have things like a microphone that people will sing into, you'll have instruments like a piano, You'll have guitars, basses, drums. You'll have a pastor's handheld mic for announcements, or you'll have other mics for um, uh, the speaker who speaks. And there's all kinds of different things that can come into a sound system. And then those will all go into a mixing board. Someone will mix those to the be desired level so it'll sound right. That'll send out into some kind of a main speaker. And those could be either passive or active which usually means then it goes through an amplifier before that. So it goes from an amplifier to a main speaker. That sends the, the sound to the congregation. And then it can also send signals out to personal monitors for band members on the stage. It can also send out things to record decks or effects units and those types of things. So these are the very fundamentals of any sound system. They're the very simple basics. And this will kind of give you the idea of the flow. So things go in, they get mixed, and then they go out to different places. It's very simple, but the better you know it and the better you know how it all connects, the better you will do. But in most modern uh, churches and in most modern sound settings, there's actually quite a bit more than these simple basics. In addition now, most digital mixing boards can be controlled uh, with an iPad. Most of them also will have some form of personal monitoring so that the band members can dial in their own mix so they can hear what they need to hear well. And then many will be able to incorporate uh, laptops as well as digital audio snakes, which we'll cover more in a minute. If you have your sound system set up well, you're going to be much less prone to having feedback. And I want to just talk about feedback for a second. It's actually a fairly complex topic, but by knowing a few simple rules around feedback, you can dramatically reduce the amount of feedback you have in your system. So first, I'm going to show you how you make feedback on purpose, just to uh, show you how it happens. So what happens is a sound source, like my voice, will be picked up by a microphone. It'll go through the cable into a mixing board. It'll be amplified by an amplifier, sent out to a main speaker, and feedback occurs when that sound now enters the microphone again. So that sound enters from the speaker into the microphone and then it causes a loop and then it goes back through the, the, the cable, back through the mixing board and then back out through the speaker. So it causes this continuous loop and it can cause the sound to just uncontrollably get loud and squeal and which we know is feedback. So I'm going to show you how easily this is and warning it's going to be terrible. So turn the channel on, I start talking into this microphone and it starts coming out of the speaker. So now that I'm further away and that the speaker is not facing this microphone directly, it sounds just fine. But even as I move this just a little bit close, it's going to squeal just terribly uncontrollably. So this is a dramatic example. But you can see how if the sound goes through that loop, it very easily causes feedback. 
So to prevent it, the most obvious thing to do is to not have speakers shooting directly into your mics, but there's actually a lot more to it than that. The best thing you can do is these four simple steps. The first one is having performers uh, a bit closer to their microphones. So it's not that people have to entirely eat a microphone, but if someone holds a microphone down here, for example, and then talks very quietly, you'll have to keep turning that channel up and up and up to get enough level, which means you're gonna send a lot more sound like through the sound system of that channel, and their mic is much more prone to be picking itself back up again, and so you're much more prone to having feedback. So by simply moving the microphone closer to the performer's mouth, you'll have a much less chance of feedback. The second thing is you wanna never have speakers shoot directly into a microphone. This includes monitors on the stage for a band, and that way um, the sound won't cause that, that loop. The third thing is having the speakers a little further away from the microphones, and so therefore in most stages you'll see that the, the speakers are all the way up to the, the roof uh, of the building, all, all the way up to the deck, and a little bit in front of the stage. This way the speakers aren't shooting into the mics and they're uh, further away from the microphones as possible from, from the performers. And the last thing is having the main speakers closer to your uh, congregation or audience. So these always can't be accomplished perfectly because again, you need to spread the, the speakers and you need to have it further from the mics. But if you have them uh, somewhat closer to the congregation, they don't have to be turned up as loud to, in order for everybody to hear them as easily and there won't be as much sound to get picked back up into those microphones. So there is more to feedback than just those topics, but if you follow those four main principles, your whole sound system should have significantly less feedback. And now I wanna talk about the individual sound system components with a little bit more detail. So the first one is a mixing board or a console. We had a lot of talk about that in the last session, and we've talked about it um, a little bit today already, and we're gonna have it even more in the next session. So we're not gonna go into a lot of detail, but the mixing board, again, is the main hub of channels going in and back out of the system. I'm gonna jump next to the speakers. There's three main type of speakers. These are what are called main speakers, and these are the main speakers used to send the sound to the congregation. They're sometimes called full range speakers as they cover from the low mid range of frequencies to the high frequencies they're gonna cover the vast majority of the sound for the congregation to hear. The next is a subwoofer. They're very much like a main speaker. They're even a type of main speaker. And they are uh, made only to cover the very low frequencies, usually 130 hertz and lower. And so all they're gonna get is the, the, the very low frequencies of a sound. And then the last type of speaker is what is usually called to or referred to as a monitor. It's a stage monitor or a floor wedge, it has a few different names. Essentially, it's any kind of speaker that's made so for a musician on the stage in order to be able to hear themselves well. With main speakers and with monitors, there's two different types of them. Generally, there's many different brands and uh, power levels and things, but the main two different types are called passive and active. This speaker here is a main speaker and it's passive. And what that means is it doesn't have an amplifier built right into it. So it needs this external amplifier to, to be able to be powered. So that the sound signal actually goes into the amplifier and then there's a speaker con connection which is gonna goes into the speaker. Um, this floor monitor, however, has an amplifier built into it. So it has the same thing, it's just now built into that monitor so that it's called a powered wedge or powered monitor, powered speaker. So whenever you hear that term powered or un unpowered or passive or active, it's referring to whether or not they have a built-in amplifier or not. And it's good to know what you have because it'll affect, of course, how you send signals to it. The next part of most modern sound systems is now some form of personal monitoring. As I briefly alluded to before, these are systems that allow musicians to pick what they want to hear either in their own headphones or sometimes fed into their own wedges. We have two different ones represented here. These are the ones most people know of called Avion. It's a brand name. Um, there's many other newer ones that are actually a bit better on the market. One of them is, is this Allen and Heath ME system. So Church of the Rock, we have these two different systems at the different campuses and they work very well. We also even have a third system where there is an iPhone app where we actually control the mixing board through your iPhone. And that's through the new Yamaha TF boards, which we'll cover next week. So, 
these are all now become an integral part of a sound system and it allows the person who's mixing front of house for the congregation to not have to mix a separate mix for every single band member, usually only for a few singers up front. Well, we live in a world that's gone more and more wireless. There's more Bluetooth and Wi-Fi than ever before. But in any, any kind of professional audio environment, the vast majority of things are still connected through cables, and therefore they need cable connections. So today I want to walk through all of those, and then I'm going to talk through a few other main components of a sound system, especially at Church of the Rock. Now, the very first uh, most commonly used cable and cable connection in the live sound world is an XLR cable. XLR cables can also be referred to as microphone cables, but that's not necessarily the best name for them because they're used for a lot more than microphones. But for any microphone, you will be using this cable. They have a female end shown here and a male end shown here. And they're very good for connecting in microphones, DI boxes, which I'll explain in a minute. They're very good for sending signals a long distance and they don't pick up uh, interference um, in those distances. So that's why they're probably the most commonly used. They're rugged, they don't break easily, they're easy to fix. So anybody who does any kind of professional audio, you'll see a large number of XLR cables around. These are what's called a balanced cable. And that's again why they're not picking up hum uh, and other uh, interference as they travel long distances. I'm going to cover that better in just a minute. The next most common type of cable connection is called either quarter inch or TS or instrument. And these are what's used to, sometimes they're even called patch cables. They're used to connect a monophonic, a mono signal, usually into a amplifier. They're used to connect sometimes a synthesizer or something like that into a DI box. And any kind of guitarist will have a bunch of these because they're sometimes called guitar cables even. And basically they plug their guitar into their guitar amp. And so they're a common connection. They only have two instead of three connectors. They have a tip and a sleeve. That's why sometimes they're called TS cables. And these are unbalanced, so these, if they were run long distances, they would pick up interference and they, they wouldn't sound nearly as good. The next type is called TRS. So if the other ones were TS, these ones are called TRS. So that's because they have three connectors. They have a tip, a ring, and a sleeve. These can be used either for a stereo source, so if there's a left and a right, two separate sources, and if that's the case, they would be unbalanced, they would go and they would pick up interference. If these are used for a mono signal, then they would be balanced. They would have a positive, negative, and a ground. And so therefore, these signals are used, uh, again, to keep things from losing, um, or for gaining interference, uh, for running long distances, or they're just used to connect stereo sources. Sometimes you'll see headphones with this larger jack. This is also called a quarter inch jack because it's a roughly quarter inch wide. And uh, again, very commonly used, but less used than the TS cable or the XLR. A smaller version of that is what everybody would know as a headphone jack. It's also known as an eighth inch jack because it's now roughly an eighth of an inch. And otherwise, it's, it's the same. It's just a smaller connection. The next most common use uh, type of cable that there is in the uh, professional audio world are speaker cables. Now, with speaker cables, the cables themselves are usually just straight wires. There's usually two straight wires like this, but how they actually connect to different devices can vary quite a bit. They can either remain as two bare wires and be plugged directly into things, usually with some sort of mechanism where you screw down the bare wires themselves. But then there's also this connection called a speak-on connection, and this is a way to make that connection safer, uh, easier to plug in because you can just turn and plug it in and it has a locking mechanism. It's also easier to make these bi-amped if you ever have a system set up like that. And so this is a nice system. Most of our speakers are connected this way, not all of them. And it's a great, it's a great system. But you'll want to be careful with speaker cables because this is also a connection for a speaker cable. And it looks exactly the same as a TS cable because it is. And we always label our speaker cables because speaker, the cable itself is different. The wires being used have different um, impedances. They expect 
voltage differently, they're not wrapped the same. And so you cannot use a speaker cable in the same place you would use a patch cable or a quarter inch cable. If something requires a speaker cable, it needs a speaker cable. If something requires a patch cable, it requires a patch cable. Um, you, don't you won't necessarily blow your system up if you use the wrong cable, but you very likely will inter encounter some sort of problems, either with levels or distortion interference, and it can actually damage some systems. So we always label, our, if we have a speaker cable that's got a quarter inch in, we always label it to try to make sure that doesn't happen. And I mentioned that most modern sound systems use digital audio, and now most digital audio is transferred through um, network cables. So these can be called network cables, and they can either be CAT5E or CAT6 cables. And this connector is called an RJ45 connector. A lot of people just know it as an Ethernet jack. And it's what you would commonly see to plug your internet into like a, um, a wired internet system. And so it's used to transfer audio. It can actually also be useful as personal monitors. There's lots of different uses for it. One thing that's nice though, in the professional world, that these ends actually aren't that great. They have a little tab that can be torn off. They become almost like a fish hook and they, they, they grab other cables really badly. So a company has come out with a nice connection uh, that, that makes them more rugged, that they plug into things better, they're less likely to break, and they are more likely to uh, work well under, in, in a live professional environment. I believe these are called Ethercon connections. There's a few other names for them as well. That's the main cable connections that you'll see in a live sound system. There are a few others. There is uh, optical and RCA. There's a few other things that you'll see more um, commonly in like a home, um, home stereo system that you won't see in a professional environment, but I wanted to cover what we mostly use here at Church of the Rock and what you're most commonly going to see in any kind of sound system at a church. Moving away from specifically cable connections, now I want to talk about snakes. So this is an example of an analog snake or copper snake, and essentially it's just a number of XLR cables. Uh, put together in, in essence. You have multiple, some of them call it a multi-core cable. So instead of having one connection to one source, you can have multiples. In this case, there is um, 16. And they can go both directions. Sometimes you can re-solder these and change them if you would like. And so on one end, they'll have where you can usually have leave on the stage and plug them in. And on the other end, you will have all the individual XLR connections to plug into your soundboard. Now I mentioned previously that most sound systems now have digital snakes and they work on a different principle in the fact that they're not multi-core, they're still usually just one cable, but they'll digitally now transfer multiple channels. So they'll have some type of interface like this where you'll have multiple inputs and outputs, but then they'll have one CAT5 cable usually that goes into a digital mixing board and you can receive and send all your signals uh, through that one cable. Other really important sound system components are DI boxes. So this is a one variation on a DI box. The DI stands for direct injection. And basically anytime you have a sound source that only has a quarter inch output, something like a synthesizer, acoustic guitar, or bass guitar, in order to get that to your mixing board without picking up interference, like I said, you need to now convert that quarter inch cable into an XLR cable. It also changes things like impedance and other things. You can look that up if you're more curious about it. But as long as you know that if something is a, has only a quarter inch output, it needs to be converted using a DI box. There's different levels of quality of DI boxes. Some of them are used more specifically for things like laptop computers and other things like that. This one is used oftentimes for basically anything where you require it. So I could use this for an acoustic guitar, could use it for a synthesizer, could use it for a bass, although oftentimes with bass guitar, they have specialized ones that also change the tone. And um, we often at this church use that one and this one. The, it's a little smaller, it's a little bit cheaper, and it works well for what we do. But both of these are really rugged, both of them work really well. So if you see either of these boxes or anything like them, you'll know that you're looking at a DI box. A few details about them. The main thing that they have 
is they have an input. They have an input where you plug a quarter inch cable in. They have a pad, so if the signal is really loud, you can turn it lower with a simple press of a button. They have a through, so that if it's an acoustic guitar player, they can still send it to their amplifier. And then on the other side, they have an XLR output and a ground lift. Sometimes when you plug something in this way, it, gets, it develops a hum. And there's times where by pressing this button, you can remove the hum. So those are the main features of the DI-Box. It's good to know what they're used for and how you use them. And they'll definitely help you in your live sound systems. And then lastly for now, I wanted to talk to you about microphones. So this is a wide selection of microphones that we use here at Church of the Rock. This first one is a DeCapo wrap. It is used when we ever have a pastor who, uh, who is not um, on our live TV broadcast. And this puts the microphone within inches of the source, which, always, which I mentioned earlier is a great way to get rid of feedback. These are meant to pick up uh, just a live speaker by themselves and they plug into a wireless pack. The next is probably the most common microphone in the world, the Shure SM58. It is the most common handheld microphone for vocals and it works well, it's hard to break. They um, sound fairly good on many different vocals. And so you'll see this, this microphone very often in many different environments. This is its cousin, the Shure SM57. It is the similar way where it's very common, very rugged. It's actually almost the same microphone, but now it's made for things like a snare or electric guitar. Uh, these are all uh, kind of tuned to the use for those purposes better, and they work well. As you've seen already in the previous session, this is the Sennheiser wireless mics that we use here, the E835 if you're interested. And they're very good for, um, they sound a lot like the SM58 where they're kind of tuned for uh, spoken word. They also have a great wireless system that works well with the systems that we have. The last one is an AKG C1000. This is a really great instrument for our choir. We like to use it for when we have a choir because it seems to pick them up very naturally and well. It also picks up acoustic instruments quite well, things like um, percussion instruments or acoustic guitars if they don't have their own pickup. So great microphone and it's really helpful. So like was covered in the last session, using the correct microphone for the correct source will really improve the, the quality of the sound you get, will reduce the amount of feedback you have, and it'll help you to just have a really great operating sound system. Well, when you set up a stage for a worship band or for a pastor, there is a number of things that you want to consider as you position things on the stage. It might not be as simple as it first seems. The first thing is you want to consider is the band's sight lines and comfort. So now remember from the first session we talked about how we are here to serve the worship band, we're here to serve the pastor, and we want to make a foundation for them so they can worship their best. So we want to make sure that whenever we can, we can make the things as comfortable and as, as well positioned for them as possible. So one thing you'll want to do is make sure that they can uh, hear their monitor well, that they have good spacing for that. And that's why it's good to check where the spacing is between things. You also want to make sure they're not hearing someone else's monitor too much. So the way you angle them from each other, away from each other can be helpful for that. Another thing is making sure that it's just physically have enough room. So one thing I have this weird habit, I always, if, if I'm checking the guitar, I'll make the guitar a guitar -y pose, a bassy bass, you know. Because what I'm trying to do is kind of say, do I have room? Am I, is anything bumping me? Is anything close? So you want to check those kinds of things. If there's ever a situation where there's a conflict between what you need to do to make something work and the worship band's comfort. This is where you really want to be developing that relationship with the worship band, with the worship leader, and then you can discuss with them why that might be the case and have a good dialogue so it doesn't become anything where they feel like you're trying to ruin their set or make them uncomfortable. Sometimes there has to be compromises, so it's best for you to explain that well, that you're, you, you want the best for the whole worship experience, and that might mean having to compromise their comfort or their sight lines. And I mentioned sight lines, they usually almost always need to be able to see the worship leader because most worship bands are doing things on cues. So if they're trying to get their cues from the worship leader, they have to physically be able to see them. So that's why sometimes we'll use the space you have on a stage. If your stage is a little smaller, you're gonna have to be a bit more creative with how you use it. But you wanna consider the band sight lines and the band's comfort as one of the top priorities.
So the next thing you want to consider when you're setting up your stage might seem obvious, but it's called connectivity. Basically, can you plug everything in and can you get all your audio cables to it? And can you make everything just physically work? And when you're considering that, you want to also consider how it looks on the stage, how your stage appearance is, and how your cable runs are. So I want to talk about these two together because they kind of work together. So basically what you want to do is you want to have your stage laid out in such a way where these things don't have to be run for the most part really long distances and especially not over any paths where people would be walking. So if you look for example here, we have a box, what's called a stage box, some call them stage pockets. And in here, it's hard to, you probably can't see it, but there is electrical, there is CAT6 connections for a personal monitor system, there's XLR cables, and there is also a DI box from this synthesizer. As I mentioned, synthesizers need a quarter inch cable that go into a DI box. That's actually all located down here. So it serves two purposes. First of all, there's less stuff on the stage, so it's cleaner, easier to see. And also there's less stuff for people to trip on. You don't want people to be unsafe, and you don't want people to get hurt or pull any system down and wreck it. So if you take a look here, I'll put this cover back in. That we have a fairly neat line of a couple of cables that come out fairly close to the instrument and this person could walk on either side of this synthesizer and not trip on any cables, not trip on anything, they could play comfortably, they could leave over here, they could walk in front of it. They only have one little spot to avoid and they can see it clearly. So when you're doing your stage plot you want to be able to plug everything in and you want to be able to have clean lines that will look better, especially if you have any kind of video. The unclean cables look terrible on video usually, so you want to have things as clean as possible, as straight of lines as possible, and you want to be able to have things be safe for everybody. And even if you notice on some of these, some of our cables are actually taped down onto the stands so that they're not all hanging loose, that they go along the, the cable stands, and everything becomes much neater and easier to work with. But one thing you'll need, one skill that's invaluable for an audio tech who wants to have a clean stage is learning cable wrapping. If you didn't know that there was a way to wrap cable, then you obviously need to hear this. <laughs> There's so many times where someone could wrap a cable incorrectly and not realize that they're actually causing it to become tangled and they're causing it to be even get over the long term uh, wrecked. It can actually cause the wires to tighten up and pull off their ends. So there's one really important skill to learn is called cable wrapping. I'm gonna quickly show you it now. So I'm gonna take this XLR cable here and uh, one thing you'll find with XLR cables, you, know, you almost never actually physically throw them, but if they are wrapped correctly, uh, you should be able to do that without any knots, any tangles, and it should, it should be perfectly laid out flat. And it doesn't damage XLR cables to throw them. What's much more damaging for cables is if they get bent down really hard or pulled out really hard, so throwing is, is perfectly fine for them. So I'm just gonna do that now. And as I throw out the cable, you notice that there was no, there was no knots, there was nothing getting tangled up. So this means this was wrapped correctly. So the correct way to wrap a cable is called over-under wrapping. Basically one loop goes over and one loop goes under and you keep on alternating. So the over loop is just a regular loop. You just literally take the cable and make just a regular loop any way you want to do that. As long as you're achieving just a, a, a circular loop. And one thing I should mention if your uh, dominant hand I find is your left hand, then you will um, hold it in your right, if your dominant hand is your right, you hold it in your left. There's actually different techniques where some people do that the opposite. I've found this to be effective. If you find it more effective in the other hand, feel free to use that, as long as you achieve always that over under wrap. So I'll start, yeah, and since I'm right handed, I start it with my left. I have the connector facing me. I make a regular loop, and that's the over loop. The under loop is, is trickier and takes a lot of people some time to get used to it. Um, what you're trying to do is trying to have the cable fall under itself. So one method is to hold it approximately there. You can spin the cable towards yourself while you're lifting it up and you'll notice that it falls uh, under itself. So the cable does not go in front, it actually goes behind itself and you get that kind of a loop. Let me do a regular over loop and then another under using that method. It goes under itself like that. So that is what you're trying to achieve. Then another way to do that is to have your hand facing forward and then you pull towards yourself and up and you notice how you're achieving that same under loop. It's falling under itself. 
you do always again an over loop. There's another way where you can have your hand more facing this direction and do the same thing. So over, under, over, under. This is something definitely which will be helpful to have uh, someone with you. If you could attend the class, that would be ideal. But if you can't, do your best to watch this closely. Try a few different ways. I'll go back to you know, spinning towards myself and lifting it up and it falls underneath. And, you, and then you try to get the right size. And then I'll go back to the other one where you have your hand um, forward. You can have your hand a few different ones, like forward like this, you kind of pinch it and you lift it and then towards yourself and, and so you spin and lift. Hope that makes sense. And then if I did that correctly, there should be no loops again. And there is not. Another thing to learn quickly is doing that same exact wrapping method, but on the ground. Because sometimes you have a very heavy cable and it's very uh, awkward to hold it in your hand for too long. So if you learn how to do this on the ground, that'll be even helpful still. So you can use either both hands then or have one hand underneath it if that makes it easier for you. But this is how to wrap an audio cable. Um, just want to emphasize that for anything you do at any thing at Church of the Rock, you want to wrap any cable like this. Again, you're going to have cables that don't knot on you. They're going to be easier to set up. And so just imagine, let's say you, um, we do something like church camp and there's like 75 cables or 100 cables. And imagine if they were all wrapped incorrectly and all knotted, it would take hours to clean that up. So we want to make sure that we do this correctly. And we also want to make sure our cables last as long as we can. The last... The last important thing when you're setting up a stage is, actually there's two more things. This, the, one of them is uh, stage volume. So I mentioned that most musicians have their own monitors on the stage so they can hear their own mix, hear the instruments they need to hear. Um, but as those, if that gets too loud and if everybody's monitor starts getting too loud, that sound will now pick up in everybody else's mics and you'll start to have an overall muddier, less clean sounding mix. You'll also have more prone chance to feedback because now you have more sound overall that could get picked up into more microphones. And so having a, your sound system laid out so that the monitors are in such a way they don't have to be turned up quite as much. And also just as a sound guy kind of trying to reinforce that we want people to have their monitors only what they need but nothing more than they need. And if you can manage that really well you'll have again a cleaner mix and less chance of feedback. Do that. Mm, sorry. And then the very last thing you want to consider is stage design and lighting. So we have that kind of near the end, but if you are trying to make your stage an environment where people can come into a church and feel comfortable and worship God well, if the stage is laid out really poorly or people can't see musicians or if the, if the set looks bad, that's not going to work well for people. So you want to make sure that the stage is set up in such a way where it looks good and that people are lit well. Sometimes that won't be your job to make sure it's lit well, but you want to be sh make sure you're aware of it so you might not position something where you know is very dark. So those are all the different kinds of things. There's probably even a few more, but those are the main factors in setting up a stage so that it'll be functional for the band and for a speaker who talks. And now we want to talk about troubleshooting. And basically the ability to quickly find a problem with your system and fix it is an invaluable skill to learn in audio. With any system, no matter how well it's set up, there's bound to have something go wrong. And so if you want to keep a cool head and fix things quickly, you're going to get your band is going to be happier because they get to get back to rehearsal and you get to have your system work well and not have a panic. So there's actually really important skills in troubleshooting, some people seem to be naturally better at being able to quickly find a problem, but if we have a very systematic method that will help anybody be able to find problems faster and fix them faster. There is really helpful approaches. The first one is just to know your system. So the reason why we've spent quite a bit of time talking about every individual part is because the better you know your system, the better you know someplace that could go wrong. Even for example, something as specific as those DI boxes, if one of those switches, switches is pushed in that shouldn't be, that could cause you problems. So knowing every little part of every part of your system is going to make you way better at troubleshooting things and you'll be able to identify problems much more quickly. The next thing you want to do is determine the problem. So if you don't have a clear understanding of what is wrong, you have nowhere to start looking. So you want to first think to yourself, um, what is the actual problem? It seem obvious, but sometimes some, you might just hear, oh, ah, something sounds bad. Well, what sounds bad? Oh, I don't have this mic. Oh, this speaker's not working. 
this, this wireless mic is giving a weird sound, you want to first of all really determine what is the problem in the first place. And then you want to examine the clues. So sometimes if you follow this simple mental checklist, it'll help you find something a lot faster. So what are the main symptoms? That could be no sound, bad sound, unwanted sounds. Uh, is the problem part of the whole system or just a small part of it? Is it just a microphone or is it an entire speaker system? Is it part of the whole mixing board? Trying to identify uh, one step kind of further down. Is it part of a main system or is it in multiple systems? Is the problem constant or intermittent? So that way you can help, is something totally dead or is it crackling or bad? And then has anything in system changed since it was working properly? So if you've added a new piece of gear, you've, you've changed your cabling, then that might be where you caused a problem. Often, just by asking yourself those questions, you might quickly go, oh yeah, this, and be able to find an answer. Most of the times, troubles can be found really quickly and you can fix them with uh, pretty, pretty simple steps. But if you haven't, you can still investigate it further. So uh, what you can start to do is try to eliminate parts of the systems that could be the problem. So, so for example, if you have a person singing, and they can be heard in, mic in headphones or in the monitors, you know that the microphone is not the problem. Because if the microphone wasn't working, you wouldn't hear it anywhere. So you can eliminate the microphone as the problem and go from there. So what you want to do if you have a, a trickier problem is you want to start from the signal flow um, in a systematic way from the beginning of the source to the end of the output. So as I talked about how you have a microphone that plugs into a mixing board, that goes out to an amp, that goes out to a speaker, and could go out to a monitor, uh, that could even get more complex, but you want to follow it down the path. So you start with the microphone, the next thing you check is the cable from the microphone to the mixer, next thing you check is settings on the mixer, then you go from the output of the mixer into however you get into your amplifier, then from the amplifier into your speaker, and at some point you should have been able to isolate the problem as you follow the path. But if you don't follow a systematic path and kind of jump all over the place, you might miss something because you weren't systematic in your approach. Sometimes there's very specific problems that you might find in certain ways. So the first one is an absence of signal. So you don't have sound on something. Almost always you check the basics first and you'll find the problem. So first you want to check that everything is actually plugged in and turned on, that the batteries aren't dead, and these are by far the most common problems. Quite often, oh, it's not, not on. Pickup's not on on an acoustic guitar. Microphone wasn't turned on. Uh, some cable wasn't plugged in. And something was muted that shouldn't be. So those are quite often the very most simple things. But then you check your equipment settings. So before you assume you have a much more complex problem, you can check uh, simpler problems. So I'm going to show you on this mixing board how one little simple button could cause major problems. So on this. This is the, the problem, this is the, the channel I have for this microphone. And right now I realize it's working and it's operating correctly. And by simply, there's this button called stereo. It sends it out to the master stereo output. If, you, if I depress this button, my signal goes away. So one little button, one little button can cause the whole thing not to work. And this button could easily be pressed by, you know, if you have some toddler you know, playing around on your mixing board, which should never happen, but could, you know, they could easily press this button and boom, signal goes away. So I just wanted to illustrate how easy it can be for one little button to cause your signal to go away. And if you, in this particular scenario, if I would have gone through the whole step, I would have, if I would have cued that channel, I would have seen the meter bounce. So I would have seen my mic's working, and the cable's working, the fader is up, the channel is on, the master is up. I could have checked all those things that all would have been working, but had I missed that one little button press, I never would have got my signal. So oftentimes it's things like that. So it could be an um, on-off button, a mute button. It could be a master fader could be down. It could be a monitor knob or a mute button or a, even a solo button, depending on how your system is set up. So. Quite often you check these very basic, simple things, and you'll almost always find your problem pretty quickly. But again, sometimes you don't, so then, you ch then that's when you go check your signal, uh, your signal path. So this is where you again go through that process of checking every connection of every cable as you go through the system, making sure they're plugged into the right things, 
making sure that, for example, if you have a synthesizer again, that the quarter inch cable goes out of the synthesizer into the input of the DI box. If it was into the other uh, quarter inch input called through, that wouldn't work, so that, that could be one problem. Then you want to make sure it's plugged in, you have an XLR cable out of the DI box, that none of the wrong buttons are pressed, that goes into the correct channel on the snake, the snake goes to the correct channel on the mixing board, the mixing board is turned on, so you see how that's when you would check your signal path after that, that point. And if you're having a really stubborn problem, especially if it's on an output, one thing you can do is try to use another alternative sound source to find your problem. So you could take your phone, play music on your phone, put it through a cable into your soundboard, and then out of your soundboard you could uh, go to the main output that's supposed to go to like a monitor, for example, and have a powered speaker with you. And as you plug a cable that you know is good into that output, into the powered monitor, see if you can hear it. If you can, that means that the problem is not the mixing board, the problem is not the output of the mixing board, it's somewhere further down the path. That's where you can maybe check that cable. And if you change that cable out and it works, then you found your problem. But if it doesn't, then you go on to the next part of the chain. Plug in your, your powered monitor there, see if it works, and you can keep on going up the chain that way. So that's another way, especially if your monitor doesn't work or some output doesn't work, that's one good way to check that. The next type of signal that the next type of problem you might have is with unwanted signals. So now you're getting a, a signal that you don't want. So instead of it being the fact that you're missing your signal that is absent, now you're getting uh, additional signals you don't want. This could often could be interference or distortion. And the troubleshooting method for this slightly differs. And usually depending on what type of unwanted signal you have might address the way you go looking for the problem. So. Sometimes if you're on your mixing board, on your, on your console, and a channel's not working, sometimes simply trying a different channel on the mixing board of the input can cause it to start working. And if that happens, then you can find the problem right there, and you know your problem is that, that mixing board channel in some way. Um, but if you try that and it doesn't work, make sure you always put things back so you don't cause a new problem. But some, unwan some common unwanted signals are uh, things like hum. Now, hum is almost always caused by a grounding problem or an electrical problem. So oftentimes if there's a DI box in your signal chain, you press that ground lift button and the hum will go away and that fixes your problem. Uh, hiss is almost always caused by poor gain structure. So if somewhere in your chain something, it could be like for example a wireless mic that is not sending out enough signal so it's being cranked up somewhere else on your mixing board or somewhere else and then as you push it up there's a lot of um, hiss because your gain structure is wrong and something's being boosted too much and something was too quiet to begin with. Um, static and crackling. So static and crackling is almost always caused by a poor uh, cable or a bad wireless signal. So if your cable starts dying, it'll intermittently start crackling or, or kind of popping and that could be because it's getting connection and the connection loses and comes back again. So the first thing you want to check is that sources uh, cables and that almost always will find your problem but sometimes wireless mics if they get poor signal will have a similar kind of static or crackling so you want to verify what you're using and how it's connected. Uh, distortion is much like hiss but that it has to do with gain structure but now it's usually the opposite so now usually somewhere in your system something is way too loud is turned up far too much and it's causing something to distort and to clip and usually that is uh, unwanted and, and usually it operates in a way that wrecks the signal and it, and it makes something not sound as good. And then the last one is wireless frequency conflicts. One I found really common, if you ever hear it, almost I could describe as digital birds. It almost sounds like bird chirping, but in a weird kind of digital way. Um, that's the telltale sign that you have two microphones set to the same frequency, if you have two wireless microphones. So I've, ever, I've done that where I've set a wireless pack to a certain frequency and didn't know that there was already another mic uh, turned on at that, uh, that frequency already, you'll get this very obvious kind of squealy, kind of almost like digital chirping, it almost sounds like. And that basically guarantees you that it's a, two, two wireless microphones are conflicting, so. And then you'll get miscellaneous problems. So sometimes the signal isn't missing, it isn't a, an entirely unwanted signal, it's just something doesn't sound right or sound bad. And so, uh, it's really important to develop your ears in audio tech for how things should sound, how things should be, and that way you'll more quickly be able to recognize when things are not as they should be. 
So some common things to investigate if this happens are your EQ settings, your compression settings, excessive reverb, uh, excessive monitors, uh, phase cancellation could be you have two microphones or two inputs from the same source, they might be phasing, canceling each other out, or dying batteries, especially on acoustic guitar sometimes, instead of the signal going away as the battery dies, it starts to get distorted or weird sounding. So I just wanna give you an example of when something might not sound right to you, but you might not be able to tell what it is. So I'm gonna go back to this microphone. And as I start talking, it sounds generally how it should. But this mixing board has a built-in reverb that is not of a very high quality. And if someone on the, the last time used it besides you turned it on and turned it on really loud, you'll get something like this. And it just should be obvious right at first that this is a really bad reverb, but sometimes you might not think of it right away. Let's try this one. And that way it sort of like sounds weird. What sounds weird? Oh, it's just way too much reverb. So as you go down, okay, now it starts to sound normal. Um, sometimes there's excessive compression. I don't think it's gonna work well on this board, but there's this compression knob and it's, not that the signal is completely ruined, but it just sort of get lo lost a bit of life and lots, loses a bit of luster. And then if, if that's the case, you can just check to see if there's some uh, compressor that's hitting way too hard. So those are a few things that you could check for if something is not unwanted, but just isn't quite right. So that was just a ton of information, but there's a lot of stuff if you want to have a good sounding service that has to be set up correctly. So we wanted to talk about the whole setup of the stage, how to do sound checks, how to check things if they're wrong, all these different things that will help you have a good sounding service. And these are really crucial skills to learn to be an effective audio tech. So I hope you'll be able to go over this in the manual, especially with experience as you start doing it. They'll become more familiar and you'll be able to then pass on these skills to somebody else. So the better you know a sound system, and especially the one you're working on in particular, the faster and more accurately you'll be able to address problems and then fix them, and in fact you will have less problems to begin with. And you know your band will definitely appreciate this because if something is failing that cuts into their time to rehearse or gets in the way of their instrument sounding right, and when you do happen to have that inevitable problem, remember to look for the obvious quick fixes first. Things like no batteries, channels turned off, and if that isn't it, then you want to check your signal in a logical sequence from the source to the destination, going from one link in the chain to the next. The first hands-on training will be for these first two sessions. We're going to do some exercises to reinforce these fundamentals, and we'll set up part of a sound system. And then the questions below should help you to remember all the stuff as well. So feel free, again, to go back to the video review if you need to. And then in session three, we're going to be covering sound check, which is a really important part of this whole process. God bless.